worked. It almost worked. All right, let's bring it in, everybody, and uh, open Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 2. Uh, Josiah was just asking, are we going back to Hebrews? And the answer is not yet, um, just kind of for obvious reasons um, that, you know, the student population's not here. We've all traveled through Hebrews together. So I thought that uh, I would wait and return to Hebrews once everybody returns. Uh, having said that, so uh, we're going to linger a little bit longer, praise the Lord, in just kind of the Christmas story. Um, you know, wherever your travels took you around the Christmas season, uh, I would hope that you were refreshed by just the, the beauty and the good news that Jesus came, that he was born, right? And so in my thinking, it's like, well, what happened next? <laughs> I don't want to just stop there, right? He was born, but uh, what's it like to live with Jesus in your life? And that's what the title of the message actually is, Living with Jesus. So we'll continue. We'll pick right up in Luke chapter 2 this morning. Uh, next week, uh, Lord willing, uh, we'll look at Matthew chapter 2, which is the account of the wise men showing up. Um, it's kind of an interesting study if you're interested uh, to harmonize Matthew and Luke. Because Luke gives a whole lot of detail about the birth of Jesus, but where does the Magi, where does that fit in? Um, so it's, it's a good exercise to read both and causes us to study and carefully analyze uh, the timing of things. So, so that'll be next week. And then the following week after that, the 22nd, three weeks from today, um, I have a conference that weekend, so my son Andy will be preaching, and then we'll go back to Hebrews on the 29th, and we'll be back in Hebrews 13. So living with Jesus, that's today's message. And I'll tell you uh, four points right up front that uh, come out of the text, pretty evident. Uh, Jesus inspires commitment. He brings consolation. He also causes conflict, it's a reality, and he brings connection. That's what it's like living with Jesus. Okay, so Mary and Joseph, Jesus has been born, they're now living with Jesus in their life. So I think as we go through this story here, picking it up in Luke chapter 221, and I'll just read through and then we'll break it down and, and draw some application. But I think we'll see uh, that there's a lot of personal connection with this. So uh, again, uh, what I'm going to try to emphasize is the commitment that Jesus uh, inspires in us to follow God and to love him. Uh, he brings consolation to us. He does cause conflict in us and around us and uh, connection with one another. So Luke 2.21 uh, the previous verse ends with the shepherds returning and glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. It was, was told them. So that's Christmas Day, right? Probably read that Christmas Eve or maybe looked at it on Christmas morning. But here we go. When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice, according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, 
a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, he said to Mary his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So beginning at verse 21, we'll just go back and uh, there's actually three things happening here. Uh, verse 21 is the circumcision of Jesus. And then verses 22 to 24, there's two more things happening. And all this was required by the word of God. It was required by the law. Circumcision on the eighth day after Jesus had been born. And then on the 40th day, Mary was to go to the temple to be ceremonially cleansed. And they were also supposed to dedicate their firstborn son, their male child, to the Lord. So uh, what's all that mean? Uh, we can talk about that real brief. Uh, circumcision is the sign that God gave to Abraham, which was a sign of the covenant that God had made. So circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, which indicated that Abraham and his descendants were God's chosen people, and through his family, God would bless the whole world. They're called Jews, okay? They were called Hebrews, and that's what that all meant, right? And you can look that up. It's in Genesis 12 and repeated a few times for Abraham, but in Genesis 17, he said, I want you to do this crazy thing of circumcising yourself and your son. And from then on, every male child, firstborn, or every male child, not just firstborn, would be circumcised on the eighth day. Additionally, as I said, uh, the purification of Mary, um, I'll be honest, it's a little fuzzy as to exactly what that's all about, because we all know there's certainly nothing wrong with giving birth. It's a beautiful, glorious, beautiful thing, right? Uh, it seems to indicate maybe that there's an acknowledgement that, and I don't know, I'm struggling a little bit here with this, but it seems to indicate that there's an acknowledgement of, you know, you've just given birth to a human being, and that human being has a sinful nature, and uh, it's not that you're defiled by birth, but we're all just recognizing that um, that's what's happened, and so it had to do, it was ceremonial, right? So for Mary to be back in the temple and to worship again, she had to go through this purification process, which included bringing a lamb for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove, I guess, for a sin offering. I got that right. And uh, if you were poor, then you could bring two birds instead of just one bird and a lamb. Okay? So that obviously indicates that Mary and Joseph uh, were poor, okay? They had not much means there. And then the other aspect, the other third thing that was happening is that uh, they were to dedicate the firstborn uh, son to the Lord. And that was something that God instituted after the Passover. And there's actually several reasons for that, in that um, God called Israel his firstborn, which means they were entitled to the inheritance so Israel inherited God, right? That's, that, that's one aspect. And uh, God's people, he actually, they, are his, they represent his inheritance, right? Because he bought them with the price of the blood of a lamb at the Passover. So this, I think I mentioned, but this whole idea of dedicating the firstborn happened after the Passover, after the people were 
saved by blood. So what happened, uh, Passover, real brief, 10th plague, uh, was the worst, most gruesome, painful thing is that an angel of death passed through the land and God had promised that every firstborn child and firstborn of an animal would die unless the only escape was to offer a, a spotless lamb and that lamb would die instead of the firstborn. The lamb would die instead of the firstborn. Lamb dies, firstborn lives. Lamb dies, firstborn lives. The only, they, only way that would happen was if you slaughtered the lamb according to God's uh, orders and you would take and apply that blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your home. And then when the death angel passed through, if he saw the blood, death passed over. That's where you come up with Passover. Death would not come to your home. And so that firstborn, in brief, it's a reminder that God's chosen people are his inheritance. It's also a reminder of freedom from slavery, right? That firstborn is God saved us, right? Uh, a lamb died and we lived, and our firstborn lived. So it's that dedication back to God. All right, so that's all free information. Uh, let's just go now and look briefly at verse 21. Um, when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. And then Luke says that this was the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Interesting. God named his own son. He sent the angel Gabriel to come to Mary and announce the birth announce her conception, but he told, Gabriel told Mary that when uh, you're, you're going to have a baby and you're going to call him Jesus. So it wasn't her choice. And then you go to Matthew and, 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 and Joseph's side of the story is an angel came to him and told him the same thing. That when Jesus is born or when the baby is born from your fiance, you will call him Jesus. Okay. And then Matthew actually tells us, because Jesus, you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So here's what I want you to be reminded of. And I'm so blessed by the worship, because there was a constant theme that I was picking up on, because I knew I was preaching this, but this holy is your name. We kept singing about the name of Jesus. So here's the etymology, okay? His Hebrew name was Yeshua right? Yeshua, which is actually compound, Jehovah and Shah, which is salvation, savior, Jehovah, savior. It tells us what his name means. God is salvation. Shortened form of Yeshua is Joshua. We have a whole book of the Bible. He's a great leader, succeeded Moses. Joshua, God is salvation, right? So then uh, when the New Testament was written in Greek language, they brought Hebrew over into Greek, but their word for Yeshua was Iesus. Okay, Iesus still means God is salvation. And then you see the, right, how that works. So then we go from Greek to English and it's Jesus. Jesus is salvation. But do you see friends, God named his son. He wanted us to know that there's something very special about this boy, that he's come from heaven, and God is salvation. He's born, but he's God, and in him is our salvation. It's actually, his name is a claim and a promise. His name is a claim of who he is, and it's a promise of what he'll do. And as I quoted there briefly from Matthew, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay? So God saves people from their sins. Hear me out, brothers and sisters. He saves us initially, and he saves us continually. Praise the Lord. Okay? So when you repent and trust in the blood of the Lamb, then you become born again of the Spirit... It's grace working in our lives. And initially, we're saved from the penalty, just like in the Passover, we're saved from the penalty of death. 
but also we're saved from the power, the controlling influence that sin has on our life. So he saves us from our sins. I think maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said, I came to give you life, salvation, and life more abundantly, freedom. Freedom from the slavery, from the fear that so cripples so many of us, right? From the power, the penalty and the power of sin. My first point that I want to make to you, what's it like to live with Jesus in your life? And the thing that, that struck my attention were the few words that were completed, or sorry, that were repeated a couple of times. In verse 21, it says, when eight days were completed, days were completed. And then again in verse 22, when the days of her purification were completed. And everything that's repeated there in 22 to 24, that it was according as it is written. It's according to the law. It's as Moses said. It's in Leviticus, the law of the Lord. So it brings, having Jesus in your life brings a greater commitment to do the things that God asks us to do, right? Um, did having Jesus in the lives of Joseph and Mary make them more committed to God? That was a question I asked myself. Did, was it, when, when the Lord was born supernaturally conceived and the whole thing, right, the Christmas story, but now we're living beyond that. And so now he's born, it's been about a week, Mary's recovering. And, uh, you know, so for the last six months, they've probably been talking about and collaborating and realizing, wait a minute, Gabriel said Jesus. And Matthew would go, yeah, he said Jesus. Well, I'd rather call him you know, Joseph, or after myself, or a family name, or no, no, he's going to be Jesus. And then Jesus is born. And now it's like, now what do we do? Now we've got God, who is salvation, under our watch. Now what do I do? I would say, don't you think it's fair to say that they became intensely interested in what do we do next? And they're pawing through their Bible, and I, they probably already, I'm sure they knew this. For Joseph himself was, presumably had been circumcised, and so it's like, well, wait a minute. The law of God says, circumcise him on the eighth day. And the law of God says, Mary, you need to stay separated for 33 days or so, and then, then you can come to the temple. And so they were 100% deeply committed to the word of God. Why did they have more interest? and desire and awareness in the word because of Jesus in their life. Because God had come to them by grace, supernaturally had come into their lives. How did Mary and Joseph, now hear me out on this. So we've, I think it's, I think we're in safe ground right here. We're using a little bit of holy imagination, trying to fill in the, the blanks of what was life like for them, right, in Bethlehem. I don't know, was he, did they stay in the garage where he was born, so to speak, right? Or did they move up to the inn because people had registered and gone back home? I don't know. All those details. I'm more interested in what was life like with Jesus in their life. And just because of the, the weight and the responsibility that any parent feels of, of having to raise a child in the world that they're living in, but especially this child, it only happens once, it'll never happen again. These two began to be very aware and, and very desirous to obey God's word. That's what it's like having Jesus in your life. He brings a greater interest and appreciation for and a desire for the word of God and a, and a, and a will to obey it. And so then I asked myself one additional question. How did Joseph and Mary go about obeying the word? How did they do that? We know that, I think we're on safe ground saying that they sought it out carefully and they wanted to do the right thing according for, to God's will. But how did they do it? Under compulsion? No, they did it voluntarily. They did it willingly and freely. And they did it, I suggest, joyfully. They did it joyfully as they saw all these things now 
it, Jesus being circumcised, and they're like, oh my God, God has come. He's identified with us. He's identified with his people. He who called and chose Abraham himself and instituted the circumcision in the first place, now he's with us. God is with us, and he's identifying 100% with his people, with his inheritance. And so there was just a sense of thrill and a joy. And that's what it's like having the grace of God working in my life. I do things voluntarily. I do them because I want to, not because I have to. He's not, they're not doing it legalistically. Parenting is one of the hardest things in life to do. And it's not getting any easier, nor will it. Joseph and Mary did these things to Jesus. They did these things to Jesus. They had him circumcised. They took him to the temple. They had him dedicated. They did them to him. But they also did it for him. When parents obey God, it's good for the children. It's good for children to see their parents structuring their lives and calendars according to the word of God out of a desire to honor him, not legalistically, but by God's grace. It's really good for the family because many times, because many times there comes a phase in life when a young person or an older person, I guess, would just say, I don't, they want to do life their own way, not their parents' way. They regret that they're forced to go to church. They feel like it's against their will. It is. <laughs> you have to do this. The struggle that that young person or older person is feeling is not with their parents. It's with God. That's what that's all about. And that's where this 14 or 16-year-old Mary becomes a beautiful example to any young person or to any older person. She heard the word of God through Gabriel. She also had serious doubts and questions about what she heard. That's good. And she inquired. And she got a little bit more information. But she believed and trusted God. And she surrendered all. One of the greatest statements in all of the Bible. When she finally said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. I have surrendered my life for the rest of my life to his service. Let it be to me according to your word. And then God graciously confirmed everything to her through her cousin Elizabeth. And she worshipped him in spirit and in truth. She worshipped God and wrote a song. Just spontaneously, a song poured out of her heart. Mary is a great example for all of us. What's it like to live with Jesus in your life? You're committed to God. And this woman, with all the unknowns around her, she knew that she was engaged. She knew that there would be eventually be a wedding. But she also knew that this, what God is asking of her would could foil all those plans, spoil all those plans. And yet she surrendered because she had enough faith in his name and his goodness that she gave what little bit she had and she said, be it unto me according to your word. So, how you doing with all that? <laughs> She's a great example. Consider this for yourself. Just consider this. If we want to try to put ourselves in Mary's shoes, consider. What do you think about most of the time? Besides yourself, <laughs> what do you spend most of your time thinking about? It's likely that the people or the things that you think about the most would be the hardest to give up. Even if it's your, your home, your children, your, your dearest, closest relationships, your family, your work, the, the neighbor, all these things. 
Mary gave it all up. What a beautiful example. And she became better for it. She became richer for it. Jesus came into her life and the Holy Spirit confirmed it to her. And there is a cost involved. With Jesus in our lives, he will inspire us to love God and obey him. That seems like a pretty obvious conclusion from these three circumcision and such that took place with Mary and Joseph. So let's go on. Verse 25, we'll think about consolation here. So interesting, they had no idea, right? Behold, there was a man. So Luke sort of steps back and now we get some information that Joseph and Mary didn't have. 40 days come, they're being obedient, joyfully, they're going to go make the six-mile trip, Bethlehem to Jerusalem. They're going to dedicate the Lord uh, to the Lord. And uh, little did they know that there was this old man who lived in the temple or lived in Jerusalem. Um, By the way, uh, there's not a lot of songs about Simeon, uh, but there is one guy named Michael Card, if you're not familiar with him, he wrote a song, right, the Song of Simeon. It's a beautiful song. I recommend it to you. To, you can listen to that this afternoon. Michael Card, Simeon's Song, I think is the title. Um, so verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout. Okay, so he was humble and faithful. He did the best he could to do right with God and other people. And he was very faithful in that, just and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. So I'm just pinging off that word consolation. All right, you ever heard of the consolation prize? (laughs) It means somebody disappointed and they lost, but they got a a prize anyway, right? The Olympia Olympia athletes. Uh, The person on the middle stand gets the gold and the other kind of get a consolation. Uh, close, but no cigar kind of a thing. Uh, but it's, it just means that. It's comfort. There's been a loss. There's been disappointment. It's solace, right? Uh, isn't that interesting that this is how uh, Jesus is referred to here as the one who brings comfort. He's the one who came to connect with us in our disappointment and loss in life, whatever those things are, and there are many, Right? And so uh, that's how Luke writes it here. It says the Holy Spirit was upon him, um, which means that Simeon was being guided and influenced and directed by the Spirit of God. All right, so here's a, a man who was faithful to God and the Holy Spirit was his friend. And the Holy Spirit was influencing him and and putting thoughts in his mind or maybe he's just having his own thoughts and he's like, I think I'll go to the temple today. I mean, you know, sometimes walking in the Spirit is really what we're seeing an example here. Walking in the Spirit is, we're not even oftentimes aware, right? I, I, I have my plans, but I've, I'm also living in constant sort of awareness of God and Jesus in my life. And, and so I do things. And then after the, the end of the day, I look back and it's like, wow, that was more than just my thinking going on there, right? The way that whole thing unfolded, it's like, Lord, thank you. The Spirit of God working very naturally and yet supernaturally through us. No, could have been that Simeon was just absolutely inspired and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and he was familiar with the Holy Spirit's uh, influence in his voice and he, because it says in verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So this man is waiting. So we get from all that, that he was probably an aged man, right? And that he was somewhere in near the, could see the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, the Lord had said, well, I got great news for you. You're not going to depart until you see my salvation, <laughs> right? And he'd been waiting for this. He, he, yeah. So verse 27, he came by the spirit into the temple, period. Okay, so just for clarity, right, Simeon comes into the temple by the Spirit. There's my point, right? He's walking in the Spirit. He comes into the temple, and he's just hanging out in the temple grounds, 
And then he's watching as people come in. How many parents came in with a 40-day-old baby in their arms? I don't know. Maybe there was only one, maybe there were several. But no doubt when Joseph and Mary showed up, the Holy Spirit, who has been guiding this man and had promised him, you're not going to die till you see the Lord, quickened his mind as soon as they arrived. So pretty cool scene. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, right? Simeon, obviously, he, he walks over and he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. Boy, did he ever. Do you see the, the beauty of that, friends? That God had said, you're not going to die until you see my my son, the promised Messiah. And this man was at the point in his life, he's like, he's ready, right? It seems that he's ready to depart and to go and be with God. And so when the fulfillment of that prophecy that he had been given walks in, he took that baby up, took him up. It literally means he welcomed him to hospitality. He enfolded him in his arms. He embraced baby Jesus, 40 days old. Jesus was in his life. And what did he bring? What happens when you have Jesus in your life? You're committed and you're comforted. There's no fear in death for this man. And Simeon said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. That struck me. Lord, you're letting me depart in peace. You've been keeping me for, so, for my whole life. Now, Lord, let me go. <laughs> what a wonderful, literally depart, dismiss me into, out of this world into your presence according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared, prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, in the glory of your people, Israel. I picked up a song or a, a little poem that, uh, about Simeon, uh, and this has nothing to do with Michael Carr, but it just says, uh, it was this, it's as if somebody put to words uh, maybe what was going on inside the heart of Simeon uh, when he holds Jesus. Uh, I mean, we have it here, but it also says here, sweet babe, let this song serve as a lullaby to thee, and for a funeral to me. <laughs> oh, sleep in my arms and let me sleep in your peace. Who was holding who? He was being held. He was being comforted. He was given great encouragement. Great encouragement. That's what happens when we live with Jesus. I need encouragement. I don't know about you. It's awfully easy to get discouraged hundreds of times a day with myself or whatever's going on. And I just want to tell you, the beauty and the difference that we have between us and Simeon is that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, Jesus changed our relationship with the Holy Spirit after his resurrection and going back to heaven. And he told us, in very simple words, in John, he said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter or consoler or helper or advocate that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, same Holy Spirit, not upon us, but in us. He will abide with you forever. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. That's what Jesus said, John 14, 16, and 17. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit and I are the same. We are one. I will come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. It tells us that God exists in three persons. I will pray the, fa I will pray the Father, and he will give you the Spirit. And he will abide with you, and he'll be in you. In you. Amen? And so now, I have this living Holy Spirit inside. I have Jesus, his 
saving me from my sin continually and in giving me encouragement to walk in confidence in his nature and to walk by faith. When you have Jesus in your life, you have great encouragement. And it couldn't be more clear. It comes right out of the the life here of Simeon. Jesus is the source of all encouragement. He is the fountain of living water. I've said it before, I'll say it again. When God gives something, it never diminishes him. Okay? Like I I could give Eric a $100 bill and I'd be that much poorer. He'd be that much better off, right? But that's not true with God. He's infinite. Whenever he gives encouragement or he gives grace or mercy, love, whatever pours out of his life, judgment, it doesn't diminish him in any way. He is. He is the fountain of living water, right? So I'm saying all that to say, be encouraged. If the Holy Spirit, if Jesus is living in your life, he's inside of you, and look to him for the solace to help us in our times of discouragement or trials that we go through. Simeon, uh, verse 33, Joseph and Mary, uh, says Joseph and his mother marveled. We'll go on to the next point here. And it, at those things which were spoken of him, no doubt they were. They were just shocked. They were amazed. It's like, dude, we're just walking in, a couple poor people, got a couple birds in a basket, I don't know, right? And we're going to just offer these things like we're supposed to. And this guy just starts, he took our baby <laughs> and he starts speaking about him. Like, how did he know that? We've never met this man in our life. The Holy Spirit starts just revealing. And Simeon's just like blessing God. He's thanking him for, for this child that's appeared, the comfort he's received, the encouragement. And Joseph and Mary are marveling at everything that's been said. Now notice this though. It's quite interesting. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary his mother, He pointed her out specifically. He said to Mary. He didn't say to them. He's looking at them. He's blessed them. But then he says to Mary. And uh, I believe that, I don't know if he knew what was happening, but again, he's just flowing with what the Spirit is inspiring him to say. And as he's blessing them, he fixes his eyes on Mary. Now, little does Simeon know that Joseph is going to die long before Mary. Before you get to the end of the Gospels, Joseph has already passed. In fact, by the time Jesus is 30 and goes public with his life, his dad's already passed. He's not to be on the scene. And you can gather that from various texts. So before Jesus was 30, Joseph had died. But Mary lived. In fact, it's in John's gospel that we see Jesus on the cross speaking to his mother. And then he said, this is your son, John, the apostle. Son, this is your mother. In other words, I want you to take care of mom when I'm gone. (laughs) Right? So he speaks to Mary specifically. And he says to Mary, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. I'm just going to skip over the parenthesis in verse 35 and continue that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. It's a little clearer if we skip the parenthesis. All right, so let me read that again and just in the same way to get the flow of it. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Close quote. Yes, come back to the parenthesis now, and now Simeon has a word directly to Mary, and he says, a sword will pierce through your own soul. Also. Also. That little word also helps me understand all the other language of fall and rise and sign and what's all that mean, right? In other words, Mary, uh, a sword is going to pierce your own soul. You are going to feel uh, uh, 
a conflict inside of you that's going to uh, be as deep as anyone could imagine, right? That's what you're going to experience because you're following me, because I'm in your life. Simeon speaks to Mary and prophesies and said, a sword will pierce through your own soul. Well, of course, to watch God is my salvation be crucified is a bottomless pit of grief to see a child wrongfully put to death. Unfathomable. <laughs> and Simeon's right, he connects the, the trouble that she will experience personally, internally, with that little word also. Also, you too will have problems. Which tells me that there's problems within and there's problems without. Because out here, outside of her, there's others who will be confronted with the gospel and there'll be a fall, there'll be a rise, and there'll be a sign that will be spoken again. Literally, sign spoken against is the idea of somebody shooting at the target. It's like preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that you're a sinner, need to repent, and people, their hearts, that light, that truth, it says it's going to reveal the thoughts of many hearts. A light has come in. And some people are drawn to the light, and some people oppose it vehemently. And it brings great conflict, opposition, turmoil. These are some of the realities that come with conflict. Strong responses for and against Jesus. Because Jesus is in our life, now here's a Christmas message we don't hear very often. Because Jesus has come to be in our life, there's going to be some troubles. He didn't promise us a rose garden. In fact, he promised us thorns. So to speak. <laughs> okay. For example, Paul. Paul would be a great example, right? We are afflicted in every way. This is Paul, 2 Corinthians. We are afflicted in every way, outside of us, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be ma manifested in our body. So it's, it's, it's a reality. In other words, and I, you, can go, you can go beyond Mary just watching Jesus be crucified because he also rose. She got to see him. She's in the upper room in Acts, right? The Holy Spirit came upon Mary as well as he did the other 119 people in the room when Peter preached. Mary spoke in tongues from all that we can gather. Right? Praise the Lord. But following Jesus and, and seeking to be committed to him and being encouraged by him as we're walking our, in our faith journey, there might be times where we're like, I'm going to surrender all. And he's like, awesome. Now I'd like you to do this. Yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> right? There's this internal turmoil, conflict that go, can often go inside. Is it my will or his will? And, and how's that going to go? Well, it's, it's, there's a sword piercing through. So you're going to trust yourself? You're going to trust me? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And the times that we do, what's the result? What's the result, brothers and sisters? You could all testify. You've been there, done that. The result is peace and joy and love for God. When we step out and do the hard thing, because I'm, we're 100% sure he said to, then... It, and, and, you know, there's just what comes is just a, a comfort and a consolation and a joy that, no, I did what you asked me to do. Maybe I didn't like the experience, but I know that you told me to do it. And what the outcome of that is, that's your business. So Mary, once again, stands as an example to all Christians that inner and outer conflicts are part of being a follower of Jesus. 
her hopes and expectations had been informed by God's word. Had been informed by God's word. And yet, they weren't always realized. Her son ended up not sitting on the throne. And until she came to a fuller knowledge, that was horribly disappointing. Understatement. She believed and related to Jesus closer, maybe more than anyone, closer than most. And yet, there was a deeper experience through suffering that would yield greater love and peace. The inner turmoil is defined here as a very painful experience. But as one man said, when we get through every one of those conflicts with God and finally say, not my will, but your will be done, we go deeper into his peace. So be encouraged by that, brothers and sisters. Simeon speaking in the power of the Spirit just tells it like it is to Mary. Right on point that she would someday be a widow. She didn't know that. I don't think she realized that until long after the fact. Because Mary's a very thoughtful woman. It repeatedly tells us she kind of kept a journal. Whether it was written or mental, both, I don't know. But she kept, she would ponder these things. She'd think more about them. It's like, wow, this quote, we're marveling. At what we've just seen and heard. Having Jesus in our lives will cause conflict that yields greater joy and peace. And then finally, the last C word is connection. Uh, there were, uh, and this is where Anna, verse 36 to 38, 84-year-old uh, 84 84 woman. Interesting, isn't it, in Luke's gospel, we have the activity of all these old people, <laughs> right? Older than me, by the way, right? So I don't know what old is, but she's 84. That's, that's old by most standards, right? Elizabeth, John the, Barons, John the Baptist's parents, they were old people, right? Uh, Simeon, apparently an old man. Uh, Anna, she was of great age, it says, and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, or literally at that very moment, as Simeon's holding Jesus, and he's giving the blessing, and he's prophesying over Mary, Anna's right there. Here stands this old woman, <laughs> however that looks like in your mind, right? And she's just smiling ear to ear. Because uh, she also understands somewhat what's going on here. And it says in verse 38, very interesting, coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. Gave thanks and spoke of him. Both of those are imperfect, meaning she kept speaking about him. She's walking around the temple. She's just blabbing to everybody she could see. That's Jesus. The Messiah is here. Uh, you're, you're old lady. <laughs> right? Call the home. Right? No, no. And she's giving thanks. She kept giving thanks. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Right? So my point here is that this unexpected visitation by or the expected, long expected visitation by Jesus, he was so warmly received and welcomed by these two old people. They connected around Jesus. Jesus, having Jesus in our lives, connects us to one another. And you find yourself loving other brothers and sisters that you never knew before. You hang out and you get to know each other a little bit. It's like, I love that brother. I love that sister. They're going after Jesus. They're looking for him to work in their lives the same way I am. The similarity between Anna and Simeon are quite interesting. Both were waiting for Jesus. Both were submitted and serving while they waited. Both prophesied, both walked in the spirit, both saw Jesus and both praised God. They had so much what Jesus in our lives, he brings a connection that is a supernatural connection. You just have this attachment to Somebody is a complete stranger and you find out they're a believer and realize, no, you're family now. You're not a foreigner, you're a family. You're my sister. I don't care where you're from or what color you are. You're my sister, you're my brother. And we're connected by Jesus who's in our lives. When Jesus is in your lives, you have communion. 
with each other. There's commitment, there's consolation, there's conflict and connection. Amen? That's the word of the Lord. Living with Jesus. I don't know, the thing that blessed me the most was just the discovery of realizing how Joseph and Mary went about all this. They just went about it very naturally. And they just kept discovering more and more and more. More truth than they'd ever known. Just by being faithful in a few little things, let's make sure it's the eighth day, and I'll wait till the 40th, and then we'll be faithful in this little seemingly strange requirement of God, and we'll offer what we have to little birds. We don't have much, but that's what we'll give, according to the word. But as they did that, they kept discovering more. And I think that's true for all of us. Be faithful, and God will reveal more of himself. Let's stand and pray. Well, thank you, Lord. May we all be like Anna, just constantly thanking you, having gratitude for entering into our lives and speaking about you to anybody that'll listen. And I pray, Lord, that that'll just flow out of us, out of pure joy, out of pure love for you, It'll just bubble right out of us all the time. Thank you that you've given your spirit to influence us all the time. Thank you for the the body of Christ. Yeah, Lord, suffering is a hard thing and it comes to us in so many different ways. But I know there's people in this room who have had a sword pierce their own soul. And they've come out the other side better for it. The great testimony. They've seen some of the deeper things of God. I praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.